This is a revision video for the chemistry only topics in unit 10 using resources. So these are the topics that you only need to know about if you're taking triple science, GCSE chemistry. If you're taking triple, you obviously also need to know about all the combined science content. So using resources, producing drinking water, recycling, writing LCAs, and also extracting metal if you're taking higher tier. There are five subtopics aimed only at GCSE chemistry students. And first up is corrosion. Corrosion is the destruction of materials by chemical reactions with substances in the environment. So that could be oxygen or water or acid rain. Iron rusting is one example of corrosion. Just remember that only iron can rust. If it's a different metal, then we don't call it rusting. Rust is hydrated iron oxide. So rusting requires the presence of both the oxygen to oxidize the iron and the water to hydrate that iron oxide afterwards. This means you can prevent rusting by keeping iron dry. So you might see desiccants like silica gel being used, or you can prevent it by keeping oxygen out. Oxygen can be eliminated by painting or greasing a surface. The oxides of some metals are actually really hard. So when aluminium oxidizes, this thin layer of aluminium oxide protects the rest of the aluminium underneath. So if you're making something out of aluminium, there's really no point in painting or greasing it because the aluminium oxide will do exactly the same job. Another option you have to prevent corrosion of iron is galvanizing, which is a sacrificial method. What that means is that you add a little bit of a more reactive element, usually zinc if we're talking about iron. And then the oxygen will preferentially react with zinc, leaving the iron unharmed. That's why it's called a sacrificial method, because the zinc is sort of sacrificed. Linked to corrosion is the second topic, alloys. You know from unit two that alloys are mixtures of metals and that they're harder than pure metals due to the disruption of the regular rows of positive ions. For unit 10, you need to know some specific examples of alloys and what they can be used for. So bronze is made from copper mixed with tin, and that's used to make coins. Brass is copper mixed with zinc, and it's used for the pins in plugs, because it's harder than copper, so the pins don't bend if you shove the plug into the wall too hard. When you're making jewellery out of gold, the gold is often alloyed, because pure gold is so soft and therefore really easily damaged. Pure gold is referred to as 24 karat gold, with 18 karat gold having 18 carats of gold and 6 carats of something else, usually silver or copper or zinc, so it's 75% gold overall. Nine karat gold is then only half as pure, so it's 37.5% gold and 63.5% other metals. You need to know about three kinds of steel. High carbon steel, which is strong but brittle. Low carbon steel, which is softer and more easily shaped. And stainless steels containing chromium and nickel, which resist corrosion. This makes stainless steel really useful for making cutlery out of, because a lot of food has small amounts of acid in it and you don't want the acid corroding your cutlery. Then we have a series of other materials, clay ceramics, glass ceramics, polymers and composites. So ceramics are non-metallic solids, usually made from a raw material that needs heating to a very high temperature. There are clay ceramics like pottery and there's glass too. Both of these are hard and waterproof, but also quite fragile and brittle and so they shatter easily if you drop them. You can easily be asked about uses of ceramics and what makes them appropriate. So for instance, we use them for bathroom tiles because they're really waterproof, but at the same time, it doesn't really matter that they're fragile because your bathroom tiles are meant to stay on the wall, not fall off on the floor. There are two kinds of glass you need to know about. Soda lime glass is used for everyday uses like making windows, and it's made from sand, sodium carbonate, that's the soda, and limestone, that's the lime. But it doesn't have a super high melting point. For lab use, and also for some other heat sensitive uses, like in the kitchen, you want what's called hard glass or borosilicate glass. And that's made from sand, that's your silica, and boron trioxide, that's your boro. Polymers again came up in unit two, but now we need a little bit more detail. So these very long chains of repeating units called monomers can have different properties, like different melting points or densities or flexibilities. And those properties will differ based firstly on the monomer they're made out of, so polyethene and polypropene obviously don't have exactly the same properties because they're fundamentally different materials, but the properties will also depend on the reaction conditions. So that means the temperature and the pressure and the catalyst used. So for instance, low density polyethene or LDPE is made under incredibly high pressure and fairly high temperature too, with a tiny bit of oxygen in there to function as a catalyst. When the polymer forms, it makes branches and those branches stop the chains from packing too tightly together. We say it has an amorphous structure. In contrast to that, high density polyethene, or HDPE, is made under relatively low pressure, maybe 10 atmospheres, 
and a slightly lower temperature, probably about 100 degrees C, with a Ziegler Natter catalyst. When it forms, the polymer chains get into these really regular rows that pack tightly together, and so the final polymer is much harder and much denser. Now, separately from that, you need to know about thermosoftening and thermosetting polymers. Thermosetting polymers look a bit like a wonky brick wall. They have cross links between the chains. Cross links are just a special kind of covalent bond. And those covalent bonds will stop the chains from moving past each other. And that means that if you heat them, they don't melt, they just stay strong until eventually they burn. In contrast to that, thermosoftening polymers don't have that. And so when you heat them, they just melt, which obviously means they're no good for functions when you need them to get hot, like insulating something that's gonna be really warm. In the exam, they could give you a scenario and ask you which polymer would be better for it or why it is that a certain polymer can't be used. So for instance, in the past, they've asked about a frying pan and the handle for that, and you were expected to realize that using a thermosoftening polymer would be no good because as the metal of the pan gets hot, so will the handle and it would just melt off. Composites are materials made out of two different materials. One is called the reinforcement, and that provides the sort of heavy duty structure. And then the second material is called the matrix or the binder, and that glues the whole thing together. So to give you an example, in steel reinforced concrete, the steel is providing the main structure and then the concrete is sort of gluing the whole thing together. Now back in unit six, we talked about reversible reactions and equilibria, and the harbour process is a classic example of this, which you now need to know about in some more detail. It's an industrial process used to produce ammonia, which is really important for making fertilizers, amongst other things. The raw materials are nitrogen, which we can just extract from the air, and hydrogen, which can be extracted from many different places, but natural gas or methane is the obvious one. These gases are mixed together and passed over an iron catalyst at 450 degrees C and 200 atmospheric pressures. Now those reaction conditions are both a compromise. High pressure will increase the yield, that means it will help us to make more ammonia, which is great, but if the pressure gets too high, then number one, this is really expensive, but also number two, it gets really dangerous. So that's why we don't increase the atmospheric pressure anymore and say go for 500 atmospheric pressures. Now increasing the temperature actually decreases the yield and this is because the forward reaction of the harbour process is exothermic. That means that the warmer the reaction is, the less ammonia we end up making out of our raw materials. The highest yield would actually be if we cooled the process right down. However, you know from unit six rates of reaction that as things get cooler, the reaction happens more slowly because the particles have less energy and they collide less frequently. So doing the reaction at a lower temperature would mean we got a higher yield, but we'd have to wait a lot longer for it. Even if we got 80% ammonia, it might take literally years to get it. So therefore we use a slightly higher temperature to maintain the rate of reaction. But realistically, that means that only about 15% of the gases are actually going to react. So what we have to do is take the nitrogen and hydrogen that haven't reacted and recycle them. When the mixture of gases comes out of the reactor, they're cooled down low enough that ammonia becomes a liquid, but nitrogen and hydrogen are still gases. So that allows us to separate out the ammonia. It's basically fractional distillation, just with cooling instead of heating. So then the leftover reactants can be recycled back into the reactor and the ammonia can be tapped off and used. Now we said that one of the uses of ammonia is in fertilizers, chemicals that are sprayed on crops to help them grow better and increase the yield. Well, here we are. NPK fertilizers are an example of a formulation. That's a mixture that's been designed as a useful product by mixing the components in carefully measured quantities to ensure that the product has the required properties. So NPK fertilizers are designed to have just the right amounts of nitrogen for making protein and phosphorus for making DNA and potassium, which plants need to open and close their stomata and make ATP. Based on the chemical formulae for these three elements, the fertilizers are called NPK fertilizers. They don't actually contain pure nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. They contain soluble salts with those elements in them. Now the ammonia that we made in the harbour process can be used to manufacture ammonium salts and also nitric acid. Potassium chloride, potassium sulphate and phosphate rock are all obtained by mining. But phosphate rock, obviously it's a rock, so you can't just spray that onto the plants directly. So that phosphate rock is then treated either with sulfuric acid or more normally with nitric acid and either one of those you're going to produce phosphoric acid which can then be added into the NPK fertilizer and also some byproduct. So phosphate rock tends to contain a lot of calcium phosphate and therefore what you make as well as the phosphoric acid is calcium nitrate or obviously if you're using sulfuric acid you'll make calcium sulfate instead. 
but the important product, the one you're actually trying to make, is the phosphoric acid, which is the bit that is going to go into the NPK fertilizer.